That's what's up. That's what's up. Come on. For many of you, that was your first time saying that's what's up in place of amen. And uh, just to clarify, it's that's what's up, not that is what's up. We bring a little, you know, of our culture here. So good to be here. Uh, as Pastor Mike said, I'm here with my wife of 16 years. Somebody, come on. Amazing. And uh, she still loves me. She's still smiling at me, which I'm thankful for. And we have four kids, uh, Joshua, who's also here in the room today, Joseph, Juliana, and Jada. We are AKA the J family. And uh, we have a dog named Jet and uh, 10 chickens. We got a little urban farm going on. So if you need some eggs, holla at your boy. Been a part of uh, the ministry of Abide for about 14 uh, years. Uh, as I said, I, I played basketball at Creighton University. Any Blue Jay fans in the house? Come on. This is my favorite service already. We got more Blue Jay fans in the house. You know, last night, Saturday night service, we were having service, and, and we celebrated all the baptisms, but there was also one conversion. One person came up to me afterwards and said, you know what? After hearing you speak, I think I'm going to start rooting for the Blue Jays. <laughs> so thank you, Jesus. <laughs> Even when I don't see it, you're working. No, I'm, I'm a Blue Jay through and through. My younger brother actually just committed and will start playing basketball at Creighton this next year. And so excited for that. Uh, when he committed to Creighton and announced his commitment to Creighton, I started getting uh, Twitter messages that said, man, I'm so excited that your son is going to be playing basketball at Creighton. <laughs> and I just want to clear the record. He's not my son. He's my brother. There is an 18-year gap in age. I'm one of 14 kids. My parents' favorite scripture verse is be fruitful and multiply. <laughs> I think they're going to stand before God and he's going to say, well done, good and faithful servants. And uh, so there's a, a lot of us. I tell people our, our, our parents don't know us by our name. They just know us by our number. I'm number five. They're like, hey, number five, get over here. And uh, But grateful for... You know, my parents saying yes to their call, and, and our ministry today is a result of, of their yes and a result of just the calling that God's had on their life, but also so many people responding to the calling that God has on their lives. We really do believe that there's one church in our city in many different expressions, and we get the opportunity to see the diversity of expressions in our city, and, and, and people worship in different ways, but man, we're worshiping one God. And we're all a part of seeing the kingdom of God become a reality right here in our city. I, I get an opportunity to speak from uh, the, the uh, scripture reading that we've been a part of as, as a church this week. And, and I'm going to speak from Isaiah uh, 58. And we're going to uh, look at how Isaiah defines, how God defines through Isaiah true worship. And we're going to get a picture of, of God's heart and, and God's standard for how he's calling each and every one of us to live. But how, how many people know that uh, different people have different standards? Different people live by a different set of rules and expectations. And, and, and there's some people, when you're around them, they cause you to want to raise your standard. They cause you to want to live differently. How many people are sitting by somebody right now? I was giving you an opportunity to say, I am. <laughs> how many people, you've been around somebody else where you're like, man, like, I don't want to pursue that standard of life. Some people call us higher, and those are the people we want to surround ourselves with. Recently, uh, earlier in this year, my wife and I got an opportunity to go with Pastor uh, Mike and, and Pastor Todd and, and Denise to this preaching conference in Atlanta. And some of the best preachers, speakers around the world were gathering for this preaching conference. And, and so Pastor uh, Todd invited us to join them, and, and we said, man, sign me up. Let's go get to hang around great people, get to be in a great environment, get to go to the ATL, holla at your boy, sign us up. And so we get there, we, we get to Atlanta, and we're in our hotel room the night before the, the conference starts, and my wife and I are just sitting there hanging out, kind of uh, uh, you know, taking a deep breath in after traveling, and uh, we get a text message from Pastor Todd. And the text message uh, says, hey, I just signed up for a 7.30 a.m. hot yoga class. I would like for you to look up the same place and sign yourselves up. 
And I would also like for you to download the Lime Scooter app. And we kind of look at each other and we're like, man, I thought we were here for a preaching conference. <laughs> and uh, so we go on and uh, we sign up and, and he tells us to meet down in the lobby at 7 a.m. the next morning. And so the next morning we get up and, and we go down to the lobby area and, and Pastor Todd is like flying around on these Lime Scooters jumping ramps and like just smiling, full of energy. And I'm sitting there saying, what in the world is going on? He's asking us to get on this Lime scooter. And so it's my first time ever downloading this app. Anybody ever ridden a Lime scooter before? You know what I'm talking about? Come on, a few of us. And, and, and so this is my first time. And so I've got the app and I, I start working on the app and I get on the Lime scooter and, and we're going. And what I didn't know at the time is when you first download the app and your first couple of rides on a Lime scooter, you don't get to go as fast as everybody else. The more you ride, the more it unlocks kind of these different levels. And so while he's flying, some of us are back here in the back pedaling, <laughs> literally trying to keep up. And, and, and so finally we get to, we ride Lime scooters to where our hot yoga session is. And then we go in there and, and, and I, I, I don't do hot yoga. I don't do yoga, <laughs> let alone hot yoga. And so we're in this hot yoga session, and I'm like trying to watch how everybody's doing stuff and dripping sweat, and we go through this experience. And then after the hot yoga session, he says, hey, we're going to get our Bibles, and we're going to ride our scooters off to a breakfast location, and we ride off to this breakfast location, and we pull out our Bibles, and we're sitting around a table, and we start going through the Word, just like we do uh, here at Love Church. And we're reading, and we're discussing, and we're talking about what God is doing in our life. And, and then we go to the conference the next day, and before the conference gets started, we had a little window of time, and, and, and we hadn't sat down and gotten into the Word yet together. And so we made sure that we spent some time. We're sitting at a table, and we're going around. We got our Bibles opened up. We're reading the Word. Everybody else is kind of just getting ready for the conference. I'm kind of looking around. I'm like, man, what's going on here? But we dive into the Word right there at the conference. And for several days, my wife and I got to interact with and, and be with people that we walked away from an incredible conference where we got to hear from the most amazing speakers from around the country. But the thing that impacted us the most was spending time with the team. The standard that they live by. The standard that, man, we're going to be active. The standard that we're going to take advantage of every moment and every opportunity. The standard that regardless of where we are, regardless of what the schedule is, we're going to take some time and we're going to spend time in our word. We're going to have discussion and conversation together. My, my standard since returning uh, from that experience has been different. I downloaded the Lime Scooter. First thing my wife and I did when we got back, we went on date night and we found some Lime Scooters. Our kids, we go to Memorial Park and we'll find the nearest Lime Scooters and we'll like get them signed up and we'll just sit there, hang out while they're riding Lime Scooters around. I'm telling you, parents, it's a game changer. We, 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 man, with our family, we go to work out or we go do activities and we bring our Bibles and we'll sit down together and we'll just open them up and the practicality, the simplicity of reading through scripture and talking about what God is saying and doing. Our standard was different because of the people we were with. And in today's a message from the prophet Isaiah, he's, he's, he's raising the standard. He's saying, hey, this is what the standard specifically for worship is all about. And, and, and he's calling our attention to live differently. And he's, he's talking uh, to people who were known as the people of God. People who understood certain things about God. They understood how to live, but they weren't living up to that standard. And sometimes we just, we need to be reminded that we're called to raise our standard. Look at the person next to you, say, you got to raise your standard. Come on, find somebody else, say, raise, you got to raise the standard. Come on, you got, you got to raise the standard for what life looks like on a consistent basis. And so Isaiah and Isaiah 58, starting in, in verse 1, he's talking to the people of God. And in that day, prophets were not only foretelling uh, the future and giving vision to the future, they were also calling people higher. They were the voice of God. And, and, and sometimes, like as we'll see in these first 
verses, there's certain things that God wants to tell his people that we may or may not want to hear. And so I can only imagine Isaiah communicating this to the people and them not being very excited to hear what he has to say. This is what Isaiah says in verse one. He says, shout with the voice of a triumphant blast. Shout aloud, don't be timid. Tell my people Israel of their sins. He said, yet they act so pious. They come to the temple every day and seem delighted to learn about me. They act like a righteous nation that would never abandon the laws of its God. They ask me to take action on their behalf, pretending they want to be near me. Again, Isaiah is, is, is talking to the people of God and God's giving him this message to tell them and, and the people were expecting God to show up on their behalf. They needed a miracle. They, 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 they needed God to, to, to rescue them and to give them freedom and to, 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 to show up in ways that they were only hoping and dreaming for. And, and so they're showing up, they're doing what they know to do expecting God to show up, but God's not listening to them. And what we see here early in these, these verses is that they're, they're pretending that they want to be near me, God says. H have you ever been around people who tell you what you want to hear because they have an ulterior motive or another agenda? If you're a, a parent, have you ever had your children come to you and say, Dad, I love you. And the first thing you said is, what do you want? <laughs> they're, they're, they're coming with this mentality that they, their real agenda is they want something from God. And so they're doing what they know to do. They're going through the motions. As we read on, it says, we have fasted before you, they say. Well, why aren't you impressed? We've been very hard on ourselves and you don't even notice. I will tell you why I respond. It's because you are fasting to please yourselves even while you fast. You keep oppressing your workers. What good is fasting when you keep on fighting and quarreling? This type of fasting will never get you anywhere with me. You humble yourselves by going through the motions of penance, bowing your heads like reeds bending in the wind. You dress in burlap and cover yourselves with ashes. Is this what you call fasting? Do you really think this will impress the Lord? Again, Isaiah is sharing this message and not a message the people wanted to hear because they were expecting from God, but he's saying, hey, you're going through the motions. You're relying on your reputation as, as people of God to carry, your, carry you, but ultimately you're, you're going through the motions. How, how many people know that sometimes the more you know something, the more you've been connected to something, the easier it is to go through the motions? I can tell you the, the longer you've been a Christian, the longer you've been walking with God, the easier it is to go through the motions. We know what words to say. We know what words to use. Man, we can show up on a Sunday morning. We, we, if we're not careful, we can go through the motions of life but have the wrong intentions and never experience all that God wants from us. And so Isaiah is sharing this, this message with the people. And he's saying, man, you guys are going through the motions. You got expectation, but you're going through the motions. But then he gives us a picture of what it really looks like to worship, what it really looks like to go after the heart of God. He says, no, this is the kind of fasting I want. He says, free those who are wrongly imprisoned. Lighten the burden on those who work for you. Let the oppressed go free and remove the chains that bind people. Share your food with the hungry and give shelter to the homeless. Give clothes to those who need them and do not hide from relatives who need your help. Come on, Isaiah, what you talking about, man? You're talking about this idea of worship and what worship looks like. And now you're talking about feeding people and, and clothing people and, and removing chains. He says, then your salvation will come like the dawn and your wounds will quickly heal. Your godliness will lead you forward, and the glory of the Lord will protect you from behind. 
He says, then when you call, the Lord will answer, yes, I am here. He will quickly reply, remove the heavy yoke of oppression. Stop pointing your finger and spreading vicious rumors. Feed the hungry. Help those in trouble. Then your light will shine out from the darkness, and the darkness around you will be as bright as noon. The Lord will guide you continually, giving you water when you are dry and restoring your strength. You will be like a well-watered garden, like an ever-flowing spring. I love this part. He says, some of you, he's talking about worship. He says, some of you will rebuild the deserted ruins of your city. Then you will be known as rebuilders of walls and restorers of homes. Isaiah is painting a picture of what worship is like. He's redefining what the people of that day understood as worship. And what we see uh, in Isaiah's uh, description is that uh, the people of God express worship in a way where the people around get to experience it. I can imagine there's multiple groups uh, sitting there and, and, and listening to Isaiah, and there's those who uh, were familiar with the ways of God, those who were familiar with the rituals and, and the habits of what it meant to be a Christian, and, and they're listening to Isaiah, and there's probably a little sense of conviction, yeah, he, he's right. We are going through the motions. We, 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 we don't have the right intentions. And so they have a, a sense of conviction that says, man, I, I probably need to live a little differently. But I also envision there there's some people that didn't know the ways of God. They didn't understand what the people of God believed. And they're, they're listening. They're hearing what Isaiah is saying. And they're saying, wow, worship looks like this? Worship looks like helping the helpless? Worship looks like freeing the oppressed? Worship looks like being rebuilders of the city? Man, that's something that I'm interested in. That's something that I could... Get behind. If this is what the people of God believe, man, that's a belief system that I'd be interested in. And so Isaiah is sharing this, this compelling message. And I love in Isaiah 59, 19, Isaiah is, is calling the people of God to this new standard of worship. And in Isaiah 59, 19, the prophet Isaiah talks about a new standard. He says, when the enemy comes in like the flood, the spirit of the Lord will lift up a standard against him. And so I, Isaiah, in the next chapter, is, is talking about this standard that would be raised up and this standard that would fight against the enemy. And the standard was Jesus. And he was painting a picture of what, what Jesus would come to do. And, and the people of God in that day were waiting for a savior. They were waiting for a rescuer. They were waiting for somebody to show up. They expected to see somebody coming in, riding on a, on a horse, and somebody to fight their battles physically. But Jesus shows up humbly. And he sets a new standard for what life should like. Have you ever realized that, biblically speaking, the standard in the Bible and the standard of Jesus is typically countercultural. Typically, the standard of our world, the standard of our culture, is very different than the standard of God. The standard of, of Jesus, we see if you want to be first, you got to be. If you want to be greatest, you got to be least. If you want to live, you got to. What? The standard that Jesus set was a different standard, and Isaiah is pointing us to this different standard of living. A couple of things that I want us to focus in on that I think apply to our lives when it comes to redefining worship and, and living for a new standard in worship. The first thing that we see is redefine worship looks more like rebuilding cities. Redefine worship is both spiritual and practical. Say spiritual and practical. Redefined worship is, is both spiritual and practical. We live in a culture and we live in a world where a lot of times it's either one or the other. It's very black and white. Either you believe in this or you believe in that. You can get with this or you can get with that. You Y'all know what I'm talking about? I'm the only one. I believe in this 
political group system, or I believe in this one. I, I, I believe in this type of uh, uh, calling, this type of work, or this one. I, I, I vote for or I cheer for this sports team or that one. I'm either a Husker or I'm a Blue Jay. You're not a Jaysker. It's a Husker and a Blue Jay together. We don't believe in that. We live in a, a culture, you're one or the other, but I think redefined worship and what we see in Isaiah is it's not one or the other, it actually can be both and. And so we see this, man, what's spiritual is also practical, and when we look at scripture, everything biblical is practical. Everything spiritual is practical. We see this theme over and over. Jesus, whether he was healing or whether he was feeding or whether he was freeing, everything spiritual, everything he believed actually became practical. The story of Abide and, and a little bit of the story that was shared earlier, my parents uh, moving into the inner city of Omaha and my, my dad being a white guy from rural town Iowa. Any white guys from Iowa in here? Come on. There's a few. There's always a few. They're like, yeah, we from Iowa, can't tell us nothing. <laughs> Iowa's a great, great, great place, great people. My dad grew up in this small town in Iowa, population 300, and so when he moved into the inner city of Omaha, he would say within the first couple of weeks, he had experiences that opened his heart and mind up to a whole different reality. And he knew that what he believed spiritually was going to have to take root differently from a practical perspective if he was going to be a part of the solution. One of the stories my dad tells when he moved into North Omaha, he met this, this lady. Her name was, they called her Big Mama. And she started a restaurant, one of the actually more famous restaurants in North Omaha. And one of their first interactions my, my dad had with Big Mama is Big Mama told my dad, white people can't be Christian. Look at the person next to you, say white people. No, I'm just kidding. Don't do that. <laughs> she told him white people can't be Christian. And my dad was shocked because he's white. He's a Christian. He was there trying to serve and help. But her experiences told her that she didn't have any positive experiences with people that didn't look like her that loved her unconditionally. And so she lived with a perception, not based on total reality, but based on her reality. And so part of the work for, for, for my dad and those of us uh, who live and work where we do is, is, is helping people see that what we believe spiritually act, actually has practical Applications. I remember when we were living in our neighborhood and we started to just beautify our neighborhood. I remember being outside and, and mowing a lawn one time and it was an old abandoned lot that had been overgrown and we didn't know who owned it, but we just started picking up trash, mowing lawns, and we're out there mowing this lawn and I remember a neighbor comes out and asks the question, hey, what are you guys doing? We said, oh, we're, we're just mowing this lawn, we're cleaning it up, we're taking care of this neighborhood and and, and she goes back in her house, and then about two minutes later, she comes back out and says, hey, what did you say you're doing? I said, oh, we're just cleaning up this, this neighborhood and mowing this lawn. She said, you know that there's a landlord who owns this lot? We said, oh, yeah, he, we, we, you know, we know we don't own it, but somebody else does. And, and she goes back in, comes back out again. She says, who, who are you guys, and why are you doing this? We said, oh, we're a part of a church, and we love our neighbors, and we love our neighborhood, and so we want to clean it up and beautify it. And, and, and she said, man, I didn't know churches did anything. Her perception was that, man, we're spiritual, we believe things, but we don't always take what we believe and apply it practically to the world around us. We have a, a saying, and we've seen God use it, when the spiritual becomes practical, it's powerful. When the spiritual becomes practical, it's palpable for the people that we're interacting with. People don't want to hear the word until they see the word. And so the first thing that we understand when, when, when Isaiah is talking and God is talking through Isaiah and he's redefining worship is, number one, it's spiritual and it's practical. Number two, it's Sunday and it's Monday. It's Sunday and it's Monday. And it's Tuesday. And it's Wednesday. And it's every single 
day of the week, and we show up on Sunday to worship. We show up with our hands lifted high in total full surrender to God, but we're surrendering to God on Sunday so we can serve our brothers and sisters and our neighbors on Monday. The surrender puts us in a posture that says, God, I want to be changed by you, and I want to be used by you so I can impact the world around me. Redefine worship. I I love coming and worshiping here at Love Church because you just need to know y'all got some special worship that goes on here with the music team. And when I, yeah, come on, you can give it up for them. (laughs) Powerful. And and, and specifically, when I get an opportunity to, to sit in the front row, man, you can feel that beat. Like when that drummer is kicking that bass drum, I'm like, I don't know if I'm having heart palpitations or what, but I can feel it. And I, and I, I love it. Like I, I love to feel the music and, and, and man, the team does such a great job of fully going all in with what God is doing. And it just creates this atmosphere and this environment where, to be honest with you, I don't want to leave. I'd love to just hang out here. But I know that I do have to leave. And I know after Sunday, Monday is right around the corner. And I believe that with what God and and, and I know the leadership of this house believes that the reason we gather on Sunday and the reason we do what we do on Sunday is because there is a Monday. And on Monday, there are people who weren't here on Sunday. They need to be here on Sunday, but they weren't here on Sunday, and they're waiting to have an encounter with the God that we say we serve. And so when we think about this idea of of, of redefined worship, it doesn't end on Sunday, but Sunday is a catalyst for what God wants to do on Monday. Galatians 5 talks about the fruits of the Spirit, and the fruits of the Spirit are love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, self-control. I love that at the end of the verse, it says, there is no law against these. In other words, a way I like to say it is, if you are living those out, can't nobody tell you nothing. (laughs) You ever been around somebody who is like overly expressing love? Somebody who's willing to just kind of give you the shirt? off their back, somebody who's willing to just invest in you, somebody who every time you see them is encouraging you and just building you up and lifting you up. And do you ever just want to tell them, hey, man, you need to calm it down a little bit? That's too much love, bro. You can't can't live like that. Or you ever been around somebody who's like full of joy, contagious joy, like Man, when you're around them, you start experiencing joy. I just want you to look at somebody. I want you to smile at them. Just look at them, at, at, look at them in the eyes until it gets awkward. <laughs> Do you know what happens when you smile at somebody? They, they feel it. They start to smile back. There's something about the fruits of God's spirit in our life that when we're fully embodying them, when we're around people, it doesn't push them away. It draws them in. It draws them to ask questions. Oh, man, I'm interested in this belief system that you have. I'm interested in in, in this God that you serve. So Isaiah He's commanding the people, but he's speaking to us saying, man, redefine worship. It's spiritual and practical. It's Sunday and it's Monday. Recently, I was uh, doing a sprint triathlon last week. And uh, if you've ever done a sprint triathlon, there is an open water swim. There's a bike and then there's a run. And, And every time I get ready for the open water swim, my prayer life goes way up because I'm praying that I survive. You get out there in the middle of the lake, and it's like, hold up, Lord Jesus. Either you're coming back for me, or I'm going to make it to the end. And so my, my prayer and really my mindset is survive the swim, get on the bike, and then get through the run. And so I get through the swim, and I survive, and I touch land, and I'm like, all right, I'm going to be all right. And I go and get on the bike, and I go through the bike ride, and then I'm on the run. And by the time you get to the run, I mean, you're pretty tired. 
You're pretty depleted. You're pushing yourself and you're going. And, and, but one of the things that I've tried to do, I've done a few triathlons and, and one of the things I try to do when I'm running and just try to live with this mentality is, man, everywhere I go, I want to bring the kingdom of God. I want people to experience the kingdom of God. And so when I'm on the run, I tell myself, when somebody runs by me, I want to encourage them. I want to encourage as many people as possible while I'm on the run. And if you've ever uh, run before, been in a race, you know that that's not the easiest thing to do. And so I'm going and people are going by and people are running because, you know, we're all in our own uh, mind space and just trying to survive. And, and I'm like, hey, man, great job. You're doing awesome. You're doing good. And, and it's, it's so funny because people are running. They'll look up. They're like, who is this brother? And what is he on right now? Then they'll start in, like saying stuff back to me, man, you're doing a great job. Keep on going. And, and so we'll, I'll, I'll just start encouraging people. And this last race, uh, this guy, I could hear him kind of coming behind me and, and he passed me and I wanted to trip him, but I was like, no, that's probably not the best thing to do. And so I kept running. He passed me and he was probably about 10, 20 feet in front of me for about two miles. And so we're running, and I'm encouraging people, and he's up front. I'm saying, let's go, man. Come on. Hey, let's finish this thing. Let's keep going. Let's keep on going. And we finally get through to the end, and we cross the finish line, and we're both pretty tired, and we're both down on our knees, and, and, and they give you a little medal, and he comes up to me afterwards, and he's like, man, he's like, you're the most encouraging person I've ever been around. And, and, and so we start to talk and have conversation, and, and we exchange information, and, 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 and for me, what, what he doesn't know or realize is that doesn't happen by accident. That happens on, on, on purpose and with intention. And as I'm running, I want the, the fruits of the Spirit to be a reality in my life, and I want people to experience it wherever I am. I also know, and we know this, that the Bible says those who refresh others will themselves be refreshed. And so as we're encouraging, as we're building, as we're there for people, we're experiencing the blessing of it. Redefined worship is spiritual and practical. Redefined worship is Sunday and Monday, and redefined worship is personal and purposeful. It's personal. Somebody say, it's personal. personal. It's personal. For every single one of us, our journey, our purpose in life starts with a personal relationship with Jesus. I was in college and just finished my freshman year of college. I got hurt. And I was in a season where uh, basketball really defined my uh, identity and, and basketball was taken away from me and, and I kind of hit rock bottom and I'm in this place where I'm low. And how many people know that sometimes when we are lowest, God is closest and that God uses rock bottom to get our attention? And I was at a rock bottom place and I tell people I was kind of a part-time Christian. I would pray part-time, read my Bible part-time and I was in that space and, and as I'm kind of reading and, and praying, I felt like God reminded me of a scripture. Revelations 3.16. The scripture says, either you're hot or you're cold. If you're lukewarm, God says, I'll spit you out of my mouth. And I felt like God spoke to me in that moment and said, Josh, either serve me 110% or don't serve me at all. And so for me, it was in that moment in my dorm room where I said, God, I want to surrender my life to you. And I want to I wanna go all in for you. I want my personal relationship to be one where I'm fully surrendered. And so that started my journey and my personal relationship. And about two years later, I'll never forget getting the call where the 16-year-old boy who grew up across the street from our house was murdered. And I remember being at his funeral. And I remember looking at his lifeless body and his hat was cocked to the side. And I remember just being filled with so much emotion. And I felt like God started to ask me some questions. Man, how could his life turn out differently? Josh, how could I use you to be a part of the solution so that stories like this don't continue to happen? And I started getting filled with emotion, and, and God started me on this journey and, 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 and started my wife and I on this journey where we had to say, God, whatever door you open up, that's what door we'll walk through. We just we don't want to stay in Omaha. We don't want to live in North Omaha, and we don't want to go into full-time ministry. <laughs> don't tell God what you won't do. And, and we entered into 
working with Abide, and we thought it would be a short-term thing, and for the last 14 years, that's been the central part of our purpose and calling. And what we uh, see and recognize when it comes to worship is it starts with a personal relationship with God, but then it moves to purposeful activity where people are impacted by our lives. And purpose happens because God gives us gifts and passions and a story. He gives us gifts, things we're good at. Naturally, he, he's wired us that way, spiritual gifts. He gives us passion. Do you know what passion most of the time is connected to? Pain. And so where we see pain in the world, where we experience pain in the world, God starts to give us this passion to see something different happen. And so we got gifts and passion and a story. And in all of our lives, everything that's led up to where your life is today is a part of the story God is telling through your life. And he uses all of it, the good, the bad, the ugly. He says, I take all that and I fill you with purpose so that you can make a difference in the places that I've called you to. And Isaiah shows us, man, redefine worship. It's not confined to my personal relationship with God. It's expressed in the purpose I live in the world. You have purpose. God has a calling on your life for a specific reason. And if we're really going to tap into what worship is all about, man, we'll never experience the full joy of God until we're walking in purpose. The last thing that we see that Isaiah really hones in on and highlights is, is that real worship takes place where we live and where there's need. Specifically in the scriptures that we read, he talks about worship and he talks about freeing the oppressed. He talks about loosening the chains. He talks about providing uh, uh, clothes and food and Isaiah is prophesying towards the future, and he's really predicting the words and life of Jesus. In Matthew 25, starting in verse 34, we see the words of Jesus. He says, then the king will say to those on his right, come you who are blessed by my father. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the creation of the world. Jesus says, for I was hungry and you fed me. I was thirsty and you gave me a drink. I was a stranger and you invited me into your home. I was naked and you gave me clothing. I was sick and you cared for me. I was in prison and you visited me. It says, then these righteous ones will reply, Lord, when did we ever see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink or a stranger and show you hospitality or naked and give you clothing? When did we ever see the sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will say, I tell you the truth, when you did it for one of the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you were doing it for me. Jesus is, is building on the words of Isaiah, and he's giving us a picture. Man, I love that you're going to church. I love that you're singing songs to me. I, I, I love that you're, you have a streak going on in the version Bible app. I, I love that you're in a small group, but worship isn't just defined by those. Worship is defined by, by the impact that you're having and specifically by the people you're going after. Worship is, is defined by, by love code number five, which says we're a church that gets out of the seats and into the Streets, come on, I love that. We're not contained or defined by what goes on in these walls. If we're gonna be worshipers, we're gonna actually have a reputation that we're rebuilders, that we're people who care about the broken, we're people who care about the marginalized. And I know in a, a city like ours, where we live can be a barrier to impacting people where there's need just simply because of proximity. Man, there's a distance. It's easy to stay in our world. It's easy to stay in our bubble. The activities of life. If you have kids involved in youth sports, how many youth sports, youth activities do we have in the house? It's a miracle you're at church on Sunday. The activity level, the schedules 
Our world keeps us from doing what God calls every single one of us to engage in. And so when there's opportunities through backpacks and school supplies, we're not just buying backpacks. We're providing hope. We're not just filling bags with school supplies. We're demonstrating love to people who are living and looking and saying, man, does anybody care about me? Is there a God who loves me? I think about a young lady who grew up two houses down from us, India. And India is a story of a young girl and lived two houses down from my wife and I. And at, at age seven, eight, nine o'clock, India would be outside kind of roaming the neighborhood by herself. She didn't really have anybody telling her uh, when to come in the house and do her homework, didn't have anybody really cooking meals for her. I remember my wife one time asked India what she was having for dinner, and she basically said, I don't know, maybe, maybe bologna and bread. India didn't have a support system. As long as we knew India, her mom was on drugs, in and out of the house. Her dad was never in her life from the beginning. She was raised by a younger brother, and the house that she was being raised in was the target of multiple drive-by shootings. I remember uh, uh, one night, there was a drive-by shooting that happened at her house, and it was so loud, and there was so many bullets. I remember going and looking out uh, the back window of our house to just check on what had happened, and, and then I went to the front of our house, and I looked out the window, and I see this truck flying down, and next thing that I know, I see the explosion of a bullet coming towards me, and I rolled over on the ground. I, said, I told my wife, I said, I think I just got shot at, and my black friends tell me it was my white side looking out the window. <laughs> when there's a drive-by, you're not supposed to look out the window, and, but I'll never forget the next day. I drove out uh, from our house and I look at India's house and there's bullet holes all through the back of her house. And so India's growing up in this survival mentality, not a lot of support. And at a, at a young age, India gets pregnant. And India, uh, as she's pregnant, my wife is meeting with her and working with her and she has no clue how to care for herself, no clue the process of pregnancy and eventually gives birth to two little boys, Zayden and Zyler. And, and these two boys both are born with health defects and, 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 and born with different challenges. And, and one of them, uh, uh, Zyler, is only given several months to live. And I'll never forget uh, going to the hospital, we were talking to India and Zyler was on life support and seeing this little baby only a couple months old with tubes uh, all throughout his body and he's just laying there lifeless and I'll never forget India asking my wife and I to dedicate her son before he passes away. First time I'd ever been in an environment like that. My wife the next day goes out and buys matching outfits for Zayden and Zyler so that she could have pictures for them before he would pass away. We go to his funeral not too long after that. And then Zayden, I remember uh, as she brought Zayden home, I remember uh, with Jen taking uh, resources to her house and diapers and things she needed to help raise him. And I'll never forget going into the house and, and she was uh, living uh, in a home with her younger brother and her dad was back in her family. But this environment that they were living in was terrible and she's basically trying to raise her son in this room. House filled with smoke. And I remember just going in there and feeling just a sense of hopelessness. And one day, uh, my wife asked India if we could watch Zayden so she could have some time to do some things that she needed to do. And I'll never forget, Zayden's at our house, and there's a picture, which I don't think I have this one, but Joshua's reading to Zayden. Our kids are playing with him. Juliana's holding him. Seeing this precious little boy. And at one point in time, Zayden's laying on the ground and our kids surround him and put their hand on him and say, man, we're gonna pray for this little guy. 
And, and my wife describes the scene for me. She said, I've never seen our, our kids pray with such intention because they understand and understood the challenges that this child is up against. And I would love to say that Zayden is the exception to the rule, but the truth is there are a lot of Zaydens in our city. And there are a lot of Zaydens in our community, and, and sometimes what we see is, is the Zaydens of the world acting out in violence, acting out in negative ways. But can I tell you, when you're set up for failure before you're even born and you're living in survival for the rest of your life, you turn to things and you do things because you know no other way to live. The thing that gives me hope and the thing that gives us hope is there is an answer, there is a solution. We see it in Isaiah's message to the people of God. We see it in Jesus' life. And the solution is when the people of God are filled with the presence of God, are empowered with the Spirit of God, are love-motivated, relationally-based, when we love out loud and we go to places of need and we bring hope and we bring life and we bring love, stories are changed and lives are impacted. And over the course of years, we've been able to see as the people of God get in the game, we've been able to see change happen. We've been able to see lives transformed. But can I say this? I believe the heart behind the message of Jesus isn't what we can do for somebody else, but it's what God wants to do inside of us. And, 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 and the, the, the story and the calling of Jesus to go to people, to love people who probably can't love us back, to invest in people that can't repay us. It's a true picture of what worship is really about. It's a true picture of us living out our faith in practical ways. It's a picture of what it looks like to be people who are known as rebuilders of the city. This is what I wrote down. The standard for Christians isn't a return on investment. Our world talks about all, that all the time, a return on investment. The standard for Christians isn't a return on investment. It's an eternal reward for making an investment in others who can't repay us. I'm telling you, love church, we are people. We get to raise the standard. We get to raise the standard. We don't have to live down to the standard of our culture, of our world. We get to raise the standard. We get to set a new standard for what worship looks like. And I believe other people, other churches, I believe people will follow this type of standard of redefined worship. And so you're here today and, and either you're saying, man, I wanna, I wanna rise up. I wanna be a part of that standard. Can I tell you the back to school bash and the block party August 12th is a small, simple, simple step to get in the game, to raise our standard for worship. And I'm telling you, God wants to, he wants to raise the standard in all of our lives. That's what he came to do. That's who he is. So we can live with purpose and intention. Father, we thank you and praise you for your word. We thank you that you give us a standard in life. God, the cool thing is, is you don't leave us to have to live up to that standard on our own. You give us your spirit as the standard that lives in and through our lives. And as a result, Lord, we get to live out this worship in a way where people get to experience the practical presence of who you are. God, I pray that this morning we would be reminded, reminded of your calling on our lives. Reminded, God, of the sacrifice you gave for each one of us. And God, reminded that our lives matter. And that when we live on purpose, when we love out loud, when we get out of the seats into the streets, people's lives are changed. And more than anything, we point people to the God we serve. We love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.